there is music in a river. In the roaring rapids and the splashing eddies. In the bustling vegetation. And even in the silent currents beneath the rippled pools. There is rhythm in the moving water. Tempo in the dynamic and changing landscape. Accompanied by a living melody composed of a thousand different voices including people. For centuries, people and rivers have moved in harmony with one another. Rivers were places of spiritual importance and a primary instrument for exploration, for transport, for commerce, and for recreation. Today, we still look to rivers for peace of mind as well as for economic well-being but we are at a critical juncture with respect to river development. Understanding this valuable and unique environment, along with the consequences of how we manage it, will be the key to protecting rivers, along with the symphony of life that pulses with the flowing water. Many people use this river. For some, it represents economic well-being. For others, recreation. Some make their home here, while others are just passing through. But we all have one thing in common. Regardless of use, it is in everyone's best interest to use this river environment in ways that will keep it as healthy as possible. Healthy means good water quality in diverse communities of plants and animals. Making good informed decisions, also known as best management practices, BMPs for short, will ensure this happens. And unlike lakefront property, when it comes to northern rivers, we're actually ahead of the game. Lakes have long attracted people to their shores. Unfortunately, when many lakefront properties were first developed, the dynamics of healthy shoreland were not well understood. As a result, we removed a lot of the vegetation that shoreland uses to protect and sustain itself. The results are only too familiar. Erosion, loss of fish and wildlife, greener lakes. Today we have a better understanding of how shoreland works, and we're having some success restoring lakes to a natural, healthy state. But it's an uphill battle. If only we could go back in time and start over at the very beginning. If only we knew then what we know now. Well, that's pretty much where we are in terms of rivers at the beginning. Residential development of river properties is only now beginning in earnest, so this is the perfect time to implement best management practices. But while good shoreland management around lakes and rivers share similar concepts and goals, there are some important differences because a river is a unique and dynamic environment. Rivers are fundamentally different than lakes. Uh, and, and the neat thing about rivers, and the fundamentally different thing about rivers, is that they flow downhill. They go from point A to point B, and point B is always located downhill of point A. Now, when we talk about rivers, we talk about watersheds. Whenever a drop of water falls from the sky onto land, it either runs along the surface of the land, or it percolates down into the soils and becomes part of groundwater. But either way, that water moves downhill and it moves towards the closest river. Watersheds can be defined either in terms of very small watersheds that might be associated with a very small river, or a watershed can also be defined as a very large thing, like say the Upper Mississippi River watershed, which might be composed of thousands of small little watersheds. Rivers are very dynamically linked to their landscape. If you were to stand on a stream bank 
and if you had the patience to stand there for a number of years, you could actually watch that stream bank move through time. And that meandering is a very natural component of what streams do. One of the most interesting aspects of the dynamic nature of streams is that they flood. Now hopefully it's not flooding into your backyard, but the whole thing about rivers and streams is that the water level changes, uh, in some cases, very dramatically through the season. And we also know that the ecology of a stream or river is fundamentally tied into those seasonal patterns. Organisms need that high flow in the springtime, just as they need the, those, those characteristic lower patterns later in the year. If you alter a stream's natural pattern, then you will alter the ecology of that river. These dynamic surroundings set the stage for a final, very significant aspect of the river environment. Healthy river corridors are ribbons of life for plants and trees, birds and animals, insects and fish. The rich blending of land, water, and wetlands is an ideal place for rooting, growing, foraging, hunting, spawning, hiding, nesting, and many other important activities of nature. And everything is woven together like the fabric in a ribbon. Nutrients in the soil and water grow plants. The plants feed and provide habitat for insects, birds, fish, and other animals. These creatures sustain each other, scatter seeds, pollinate flowers, and ultimately add their nutrients to the decomposing biomass that will feed the next generation. Obviously, these relationships are complex, but they're also very simple in the sense that if one thread of the fabric is removed or destroyed, everything starts to unravel. And nature can do a good job of recovering after an occasional fire, drought, or flood, but there's one disruptive force that cannot be counteracted, at least not in the short term. People have the ability to significantly upset the delicate balance that sustains healthy shoreland. We've proven this time and again on lakes. And in some ways, rivers are more vulnerable because even relatively minute changes in flow can drastically alter a river's entire nature. Human impacts typically come in two forms, direct impacts to the river itself and indirect impacts resulting from changes made to the surrounding land. Often, the two go hand in hand. For example, over-harvesting of timber during the logging boom of the early 20th century left some sections of land adjacent to rivers almost completely stripped of vegetation. At the same time, logs rafted down the rivers gouged and scoured the river channels, removing existing spawning beds, feeding areas, and vegetative cover. Without best management practices for guidance, these rivers were profoundly transformed. Near rivers, almost any outside work you can think of, clearing land, building, planting, even fertilizing the lawn can have indirect impacts with potentially serious consequences. In many cases, clearing vegetation is the root of the problem. Vegetation plays a number of important roles for the river environment, not the least of which is that it provides habitat for a number of organisms that live in and along the stream itself. The vegetation that grows along the stream directly provides habitat, providing shelter and overhanging cover for fish that live in the water. It also shades the water, keeping the temperature fairly constant, preventing the river from becoming too warm during the hot days of summer. The plant material that falls off the vegetation also is useful. It provides a source of food for many of the small microorganisms and insects that live in the river, and these in turn then provide food for fish and larger organisms in the river. And finally, the vegetation along the bank itself is habitat for a number of land-based creatures, including birds and other animals, as well as many insects, which in turn interact and are, are used by the organisms that live in the water, such as fish. In addition to providing habitat, vegetation along the banks plays a very important role for the river ecosystem in stabilizing the banks. The interlocking roots of the vegetation prevent the banks from breaking down, prevent all the silt and sediment that makes up the banks from entering the river. And too much silt and sediment in the river causes all sorts of problems. It makes the water muddy and unattractive. It fills in the deeper areas of the river and makes them shallow and unappealing and, and in fact unsuitable in many cases for fish. It covers, it smothers, 
the rocky areas of the stream and the vegetated areas of the stream, which are critical habitat both for feeding and for spawning of fish and other organisms in the river. Finally, and perhaps most significantly in terms of providing equilibrium for the river environment, the vegetation along the banks plays a crucial role in terms of controlling and filtering runoff that's coming towards the river from the land. Now runoff is meltwater from snow or rainwater that's coming across the landscape towards the river. And that runoff often contains all sorts of harmful things in it, soil, nutrients, and in some cases toxic substances. Vegetation along the banks acts as a filter. It traps that material, filters it out, and makes the water that finally does enter the river much cleaner and thus prevents pollution of the river, prevents loss of habitat through sedimentation of the river. Throughout the watershed, by removing vegetation, development tends to increase the quantity and decrease the quality of runoff, impacts that fall like hammer blows upon the fragile river environment. Consequences include increased flow, flooding, erosion, and sediment pollution. There's a real irony here. People are typically drawn to a river property by pristine, unspoiled qualities of the land. But by clearing the natural vegetation from the building site, they are threatening the very things that attracted them here in the first place. And while large temporary clearings created by timber harvest may outwardly seem more worrisome, land cleared for residential development will actually have greater long-term impacts. Homes, lawns, and driveways are, for all intents and purposes, permanent. The negative consequences will be long-term, and the same concerns apply to other types of permanent development. For example, a road created by filling a wetland will destroy an important habitat and transform spongy filtering soil into an impervious brick-hard surface. And that spells trouble down the road. So what's the answer? Live in a jungle? Let the plants take over? Well, not quite. But it turns out that giving them at least partial rule of the roost is a good idea. Simply stated, the best and easiest management practice for vegetation is to leave it intact wherever possible. On land earmarked for residential development, this means minimizing hard surfaces, sprawling lawns, and denuded slopes. Perhaps most importantly, it means leaving buffers of natural vegetation between cleared land and watercourses. And the same goes for timber harvesting, farming, recreational trails, or any other activity where land is cleared. Buffers of native plants and trees should be preserved so they can perform their natural functions of reducing runoff, filtering sediments and nutrients, providing wildlife habitat, and preventing erosion. Promoting vegetation is good, but the misuse of fertilizers and pesticides can also cause serious and unintended consequences. Fertilizers applied to lawns, gardens, and farm fields can quickly seep or wash into rivers where they are just as effective at growing slimy green algae. Misuse of pesticides can threaten water quality and poison aquatic insects, fish, and birds. For these reasons, the best management practice is to understand how and where these chemicals should be used and to minimize or eliminate their use. Similarly, road and sidewalk salt should be used sparingly in the winter, and fuel, oil, and other chemicals must be handled carefully. These contaminants have the potential to cause serious water quality problems especially if they become more and more concentrated downstream. A disaster waiting to happen is a building constructed on a floodplain or built without anticipating changes in the course of a river. Floods or shifting and eroding riverbanks can eventually threaten such a structure with physical and financial ruin. Remember that a riverbank is like a wild animal. You can't control it or pin it down. Homeowners, builders, and zoning officials should realize that placing buildings well back from the river is always prudent, and thoughtful consideration of a river's mechanics before construction is critical. Good planning is also important when it comes to establishing forest roads or skid trails for timber harvesting. These roads become channels for runoff and potential sources of serious sediment pollution, especially when they are poorly constructed on steep slopes, stream crossings, or over easily eroded soil. Pollution and erosion are also concerns in farming situations where livestock are given free access to a river. Keeping animals fenced away from the watercourse is an important best management practice for protecting water quality.
Man-made structures, especially dams, seriously restrict or alter the river, often with extreme consequences. Dams are typically built to harness the power of running water for grinding grain or generating electricity. The trade-off, of course, was the drowning of a river along with a good chunk of the surrounding countryside. In these cases, river habitat is also pretty much swallowed up by the reservoir. Water pools and sediments settle out of suspension in broad, muddy deposits. As the water slows and increases in surface area, cold water fish species like trout may eventually be displaced by warm water species, and migratory species may disappear as they are blocked from reaching spawning grounds. Although dams aren't really being built much anymore, there is something we are constructing on a regular basis that can have similar impacts, albeit on a smaller scale. The use of culvert pipes with roadway crossings is very common. In fact, it's so common that we need to ask ourselves, is this project necessary? And in the cases where it is necessary, we need to assure that we minimize the impacts that the crossing has on the stream. The most common problem is that the entire flow of the river is funneled into a small pipe. And if the pipe isn't adequately sized, it can act very similar to a dam. Therefore, it's very important that the sizing of the pipe be matched to the normal and high flow conditions that are expected on the river. This is especially important with high flows, where if the pipe is too small, it can lead to overtopping of the roadway and the road may be washed out. Another problem is that the culvert can act as a barrier to the movement of fish. We don't want to see the culvert placed high in an embankment, but instead we'd like to see it placed at or below the stream bed to assure that normal flows are maintained. With roadway crossings of streams, we also need to look at the big picture. There can be impacts beyond the stream itself. For example, the approach roads are often filled within a floodplain and can be a barrier to the movement of floodwaters. Other times it's fill placed within wetlands. This fill can disrupt groundwater and drainage patterns. And these are the types of impacts that we need to consider when we ask ourselves the initial question, is this project necessary? Addressing impacts within the water itself is a final area where best management practices can make a real difference. For example, although moving water is a principal agent of erosion along riverbanks, Waves from boat and jet ski wakes can greatly amplify the destructive potential. The best way to protect shoreline is slow boating, especially in tight channels where wakes still carry a lot of punch when they hit the shore. The fact is, the more natural a shoreline is, the less impact boating will have upon it. This is because aquatic plants, like their land-based counterparts, also work to prevent erosion, although they have their own way of taking care of business. Rather than binding soil, water plants defend the riverbanks by forming breakwater-like barriers that intercept and absorb wave and current energy. Thus, the best management practice for aquatic plants is to leave them undisturbed, especially along shoreland margins, although some thoughtful and selective removal may be desirable to permit boating or swimming. Be sure to check the local regulations before you remove any vegetation. Aquatic plants also provide important habitat, both above and below the waterline. Similarly, woody debris such as fallen limbs and trees create structure that is excellent habitat for fish and other organisms. Whenever possible, these things should be left in place. It's important to remember that best management practices are an attempt to preserve and enhance natural conditions. They offer solid guidelines for protecting an environment that's important to us all. By dealing with our impacts positively and proactively, we will all benefit, because a healthy river is in everyone's best interest. There's also strength in numbers. River associations are a great way for people with common concerns to join together, spread the word, and influence positive change. For additional support, information, or advice, county zoning, conservation, extension, and DNR offices are excellent resources. River management is synonymous with watershed management. There's nothing that you can do within a watershed that will not have some kind of an effect in the river way downstream. Rivers are connected ecosystems.
Removing natural vegetation and replacing it with hard surfaces such as pavement can really cause problems for the river environment. Maintaining as much natural vegetation as possible is the key to a healthy river environment. Any project along a river has impacts. Our goal should always be to understand those impacts and to minimize those impacts. From the gentle rush to the flowing water, to the songs of the birds and animals living along the banks, the sounds of a healthy river really are music to the ears. And we don't have to strain to hear it. Unlike many other types of shoreland, we aren't struggling to undo years of misguided development. Instead, future generations are depending upon us to see the big picture, embrace best management practices, and make good decisions from the very beginning. This way, the river's music will play on, and we'll never have to worry about changing our tunes.